virgin most powerful radio sharing the gospel with clarity and charity and now Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. Welcome, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo and got a great show in store for us. A great Carl Keating's coming on board. And, uh, you know, there has been a change in the religious landscape in that there is an emerging demographic of those known as spiritual but not religious. And the spiritual but not religious people are a very interesting mix of folk because, um, you know, they, they want to have some sort of contact with God, but they don't like forms. They don't like uh, institutionalized religion, so to speak. So it's kind of becomes a do-it-yourself kit. And among the interesting things that have occurred over the years with this demographic is that um, some uh, ancient Catholic practices have now become kind of in vogue. You know, uh, the spiritual but not religious are going on pilgrimages and uh, doing all sorts of stuff like that that uh, had fallen by the wayside back in maybe the you know 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Well, now it's coming back. And uh, so that's why I'm really excited because we're going to have Carl Keating on. He's going to talk about his brand new book. It's called Sun, Storm, and Solitude, Discovering Hidden Italy in the Camino de San Bernadetto. And uh, he's going to talk about his own pilgrimage on the Camino and uh, and kind of share with us. So this could be a great program for those of you who, perhaps people who know, who fall into that category, who are interested in maybe going on a pilgrimage or a hike or doing some sort of uh, spiritual exercise like that. And uh, Carl's going to give us a, a, our own little tour, not only of his book, but also of his experiences on uh, the Camino. So uh, he's going to be coming up on the other side of the break. That's going to be a lot of fun. Carl's always a wealth of info. And uh, I'm excited about his book, new book because right now it is the number one new release in religious travel. So he'll be coming on the other side of the break. In the meantime, we're going to do our own exercises not necessarily a pilgrimage, but our own little personal pilgrimage in critical thinking and church history. And with our Finding the Fallacy segment, today's Finding the Fallacy is the non sequitur. And also the Meet the Early Church Fathers, we are uh, going to meet St. Gregory of Nyssa. So a uh, great show in store for us today. So, yeah, let's kick off things with uh, what I usually do, my shout outs and welcomes to all of you watching live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Hello, everybody. And it's also the want to welcome all of you listening on radio around the United States and also around the world via podcast. Welcome aboard, folks. Great to have you with us. Um, yeah, so uh, lots of stuff in store for us. Um, if you have any questions for Carl, by the way, you can give us a call, 888-526-2151. That is 888-526-2151. Or you can always email us at questions at handsonapologetics.com, our dojo mailbox address, questions at handsonapologetics.com. And it comes straight to me, folks, and I do uh, receive and try to reply to everything. So uh, thank you for your emails. And I also want to thank all of you for doing this uh, Apologetics in Place program because uh, even though many of you might be restricted on travel, you might be restricted on wh whether you can go out, maybe you are uh, your health compromised, uh, you can still share the faith, explain the faith, and tell people about our programs on Virgin Most Powerful Radio and hands-on apologetics, you know, if especially if a topic comes up that you know of a friend or relative who's interested, uh, share the link. You know, go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org, go up to our shows, select Hands-On Apologetics, and share it with them. And uh, that way, you know, 
we can uh, share the good news, uh, evangelize the culture, and also if you could subscribe or like or you know whatever you can do on social media, we also appreciate it because higher visibility means that our mission and outreach becomes stronger. So we truly, truly appreciate it. So thank you all of you who have subscribed, and thanks in advance for those who will subscribe. Uh, why don't we jump to the Finding the Fallacy? Today's Finding the Fallacy is the non sequitur. I think actually most people are familiar with the non sequitur. It's Latin for it does not follow. Okay. And it's a convention. It could be used as a literary device. It's also often used in, for comedic purposes. And it is something said that because of apparent lack of meaning of relative to what has preceded it, uh, seems absurd to the point of being humorous or confusing. In other words, it's you're not connecting the dots with the non sequitur. Uh, when somebody will argue something and then draw a conclusion from it, the conclusion when it doesn't follow from the premises would be a, a non sequitur. For example, all cats meow, therefore cats cause earthquakes. Right? That would be a non sequitur. Because it really it doesn't follow from the premises just because cats meow that they cause earthquakes. Um, and as you can tell, the non sequitur is something that's frequently used in humor where people will just say, say things that just don't follow and it's just patently absurd. For uh, you fans who love old timey comics or comedy, I should say, uh, you know, the uh, Burns and Ellen show, for example, Gracie was a, a veritable fountain of non sequiturs and uh, because she would just say things that just didn't make sense. Uh, so anyway, just be aware of a non sequitur. It, and it, non sequiturs can sneak in under the radar screen if you're not paying attention. So it's always important when somebody's making an argument to try to follow the premises and figure out whether that naturally ends up with the conclusion. Otherwise, they could just throw something out as a conclusion. If you're not paying attention, you might think there was actually an argument made when there wasn't. And that's our finding the fallacy for today, the non sequitur. Okay, let's jump to the Meet the Early Church Father today, St. Gregory of Nyssa. St. Gregory was the younger brother of Basil of Caesarea, otherwise known as Basil the Great. He is born in the year 335 A.D. and the third of the three Cappadocian fathers. Unlike Basil, uh, he was not very good as an administrator or leader. And unlike the other Cappadocian fathers, St. Gregory of Niz, uh, Nazianzus, excuse me, uh, he was not a particularly attractive preacher. But he was an extraordinarily gifted uh, man of mystic, he was a theologian and a very good writer. In fact, the versatility of his writings far surpasses the other two Cappadocian fathers. Gregory was educated uh, for the most part by his older brother, Basil. After having advanced in the church as far as lector, he decided on a worldly career as a teacher of rhetoric, and he was married. The other Gregory convinced him to retire to Basil's monastery on the Iris, and in autumn of 371, Basil, trying to consolidate his ecclesiastical authority as a metropolitan, consecrated Gregory, Bishop of Nyssa, just as uh, he was sending the other Gregory to Salamis. And uh, Gregory of Nyssa, like Nazianzus, was consecrated rather against his preferences, if not literally against his will, says Jurgen's Faith of the Early Church Fathers. Uh, Nyssa, however, at least agreed to take the position of a C, but the other, other than that, he disappointed his brother just as much as Gregory of Nanzianzus. And Basil criticized and blamed him rather constantly for his lack of firmness, his political ecclesiastical unfitness, and his poor fiscal administration. Gregory had furthermore to contend with the considerable opposition of the Arians, who falsely accused him of misappropriating of funds at the Synod of Nyssa in 376, disposing him in absentia. But when the Emperor Valens died two years later, Gregory was able to return to Nyssa. In 379, the Synod of Antioch made him a visitator uh, in the uh, Pontus, and while he was on mission there in 380, was elected Bishop of Sebaste. In 381, at Constantinople, 
He was an outspoken in his defense of Gregory of Nazianzus, and we find him again in Constantinople to preach uh, the funeral homily over the Princess uh, Pulchera in 385, and shortly afterwards, uh, he did the same for his mother, um, or excuse me, her mother. Uh, <clears throat> he was present at a Counts um, Synod convened at Constantinople in 394 and is heard of no more among the living after that point. Oh, excuse me, folks, I had to clear my throat there. And that's our early church father for today, Gregory of Nyssa. And uh, by the way, you know, if you want to do a study of the early church, there are three people that you need to include in your study. And that's the three great Cappadocian fathers of Basil and the two Gregories, Gregory of Nyssa, who was today's early church father, and also Gregory of Nazianzus. You know, it's always interesting to hear uh, the background to these stories because uh, each one of the Cappadocian fathers had their own great talents. And it's interesting to see how God used each of them in his own way. And despite their faults, you know, nevertheless contributed an incredible amount uh, to the success of Christianity in Cappadocia. For example, Basil was an incredibly good administrator, um, very good in terms of um, uh, interacting with political, social uh, aspects of being a, a bishop. Uh, you know, Gregory Nyssa was really more of the theologian, not much of a preacher, and uh, not certainly not a good administrator. And then you have Gregory of Nazianzus, who was a very good preacher, not that great of an administrator, and uh, okay as a theologian. So each one of the three make up an incredibly important role. And I hear the music coming up. Coming up on the other side of the break, we have Master Apologist Carol Keating coming on to talk about his new book. Stay tuned, folks. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. Pro-life across America, the Billboard people. Did you know my mom's going to have a baby? She is. Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat, and my dad said this is going to be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Marianne Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. 
Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Hands on apologetics. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, there is a a new demographic out there of those who are uh, religious. And this particular segment in our population has rediscovered some very ancient uh, and holy practices of our ancestors that have unfortunately gone by the wayside, so to speak, including going on pilgrimage. Well, that's why I'm really excited to have our next guest, because uh, we're going to be talking about his new book, Sun, Storm and Solitude, Discovering Hidden Italy in the Camino de uh, San Benedetto. It is, by the way, a new number one release on Amazon in religious travel. And uh, Carl Keating, welcome to Hands On Apologetics. Thanks, Gary. It's good to be back with you. Yeah, it's great to be back with you. I know just recently you went on a hike. How did it go? Uh, sort of mixed. It was a shakedown hike, the first of the summer season. I went up in the Sierra Nevada. And I was testing both my gear and myself. The gear passed, and I more or less failed. So <laughs> I still got to get, get in a little better shape for the later hike. <laughs> but, you know, to be expected at the first hike of the season. Yeah, yeah, very good. Well, it's good that you have an assessment of where things are, you know, for the future. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's interesting that uh, there's been this rediscovery of ancient pilgrimages and hiking and all sorts of uh, piety that has gone by the wayside um, including, you know, uh, hiking on the Camino de uh, San Bernadetto. It's very interesting indeed. Uh, I was just looking at some statistics. You know, the most famous pilgrimage route, no doubt, in Europe is the Camino de Santiago in Spain, mm -hmm. which has many tendrils that all end up at Santiago de Compostela in the northwest corner of Spain where the relics of St. James the Greater are found. And it turned out that in the last several years, every each of those years, more than 300,000 people have walked part or all of that route. And that's a phenomenal number. It's far greater than it was, say, a decade ago, when I believe the number was under 200,000. So it's been a, a giant change. And it's a, it's a rather interesting demographic, too, not quite what we might expect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, why do you think uh, people are rediscovering, you know, this idea of going on uh, this kind of pilgrimage? Well, I think we first need to keep in mind what kind of people are going on these routes, whether mm -hmm. the way of St. James or the routes in, in other routes in France and in Italy. And uh, they're going for various reasons, the, but only a minority of them are going for directly religious reasons, mm -hmm. uh, the way that the, these roots, the older ones, would have been used, say, in the Middle Ages or even earlier, or even into more recent eras. Uh, most of the people who go on these routes don't consider themselves to be religious. Most of them will describe themselves as spiritual, whatever that may mean to them. Some of them go just for the exercise, just as a vacation, just to get away. But many of them are going to see the culture and to experience olden things in terms of architecture and, and so forth. But invariably, since these were all Catholic roots, you can't escape the Catholic element as you go along them. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the folks end up coming home with what I like to call premonitions of the supernatural. Uh, you know, you're, you're in a, what's really a Catholic milieu, whether it's for days or weeks as you're walking, and you can't really escape that. Of course, I mean, that's large, why you're going, even if you may not quite understand it. So you might be going just for the exercise, but uh, it will do your body good, but it also does your mind and soul good because you're confronted necessarily with uh, the church that is the origin of Western culture. Yeah. Yeah, so it kind of takes on aspects of a, a walking retreat, right? Because you have solitude, you're surrounded by beauty, and, of course, you have all these well, uh, religious shrines and so on. Yeah. Um, 
as I mentioned in my book, I'm often asked, since people, many people know that I like to hike and backpack, I'm often asked, are you going to hike the Camino de Santiago? And I say, probably not. And not because I dislike Spain. I like Spain, and the route itself looks interesting. But I like solitude, and I don't think I can fight enough on that trail if there are 300,000 other people on it during the same right. month that I might be going. Uh, now, of course, there are interludes of plenty of solitude even on such a trail. But by its very nature, when you have so many people, even if they're stretched out over a couple hundred miles, you're still going to be meeting a lot of people probably every day. And uh, so my, my response is that I'd like to go in a way, but I have other trails I'd rather go on. And one of them was the one, in fact, I did go on, which was the Camino de San Benedetto, or the Way of St. Benedict. Yeah, so how many, uh, now uh, we're familiar with the the Santiago Trail. Uh, how many trails are there in the world? Depends on how you count them. I'm just within Western Europe, there are dozens of trails. There are also, of course, ancient trails going all the way from Europe to the Holy Land, which was the original site of pilgrimage. Of course, Jerusalem would be yeah. the place you would go. And then, uh, of course, very few people could do that. I, imagine walking a few thousand miles uh, at a time when there were no roads, no real transportation effectively. Uh, very few people could pick up and just do that. So right. shorter trails such as Camino de Santiago or trails that went to Rome became popular. And Rome became the second biggest destination after Jerusalem. And then even those were too much for many people. So we have, for example, the most famous pilgrimage route in England, which was to Canterbury. And we have Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, That's right. which, of yeah. course, is built around pilgrims who are going to Canterbury to see the relics of uh, St. Thomas of Becket, who was martyred at the cathedral, cathedral there. So, so that was the Canterbury Trail from any place in England you could do in, in a week or two. You know, uh, Jerusalem would take maybe half a year effectively. Uh, coming to Santiago, depending on where you start, would take maybe a month or two, depending. And from places in France or Germany to Rome would take several weeks. So they're all major choices. And as we look over time, historically, we find shorter and shorter ones constructed so that people could still go on pilgrimage, even if they didn't have the means or the time to go on a month long pilgrimage. Yeah, yeah, very good. So, w when you were choosing the the uh, where to go, what attracted you to San Benedetto? Well, a couple of things. I'm very much fond of Italy as a whole. I've been there many times, and when I discovered that there was this relatively new trail called the Way of Saint Benedict, and uh, since I'm very fond of Benedict himself, who was the uh, founder of Western monasticism, I said to myself, this is the perfect trail. Yeah. Uh, the Camino di San Benedetto is about 305 kilometers, so it's a bit less than 200 miles long. It goes through the hill country in the Apennine Mountains from the northeast uh, to the southeast of, of Rome. Uh, usually an elevation around 300 feet or so, 3,000 feet, excuse me. It begins in the town of Norcia, ancient Nursia. Norcia is the town that St. Benedict was born in, in 480. And the trail goes at about its midpoint to Subiaco, which is where he spent his formative years, the first three years, living in the cave high on a hillside, on a cliffside, and where he eventually built about a dozen monasteries. And then the Camino ends at Monte Cassino, uh, which is where Benedict died. So uh, there were uh, several reasons, you know, just the topography, Benedict himself, the newness of the trail, the relative um, advantage of having some chance for solitude. Uh, as I say, the Camino de Santiago gets about 300,000 plus people a year. The Camino de San Benedetto gets about 5,000. So big difference. 
Yeah. So when you say a new trail, uh, is that um, like newly constructed trail or is this um, uh, just a, a whole new uh, pilgrimage route? Well, well, both. The trail itself was constructed uh, less than a decade ago now by a man named Simone Frignani, who lives near Bologna, uh, several hundred miles to the north of the trail. Uh, he's a school teacher, Catholic, mm -hmm. and uh, he was somebody that I interviewed before actually I went on the trail. Oh, wow. And he explained to me that he had gone through some personal problems of a serious nature, and uh, part of his getting past them was simply going out and walking. And, and he realized uh, that uh, one of the things that might be good for him and for others would be to uh, make a trail in honor of St. Benedict, uh, a trail that would follow basically the path that Benedict would have taken so many centuries ago. And so Simone went out and pieced the trail together. In some areas, there were existing paths. In other areas, he made connecting segments. And along the way, he made many friends uh, called the Amici de San Benedetto. There's the Friends of St. Benedict. And those were local folks who assisted him in construction and upkeep. And they made signage for the trail, and they made maps and guidebooks and so on. He, Simone wrote a wonderful guidebook, the, the best printed guidebook I've ever seen for a trail. It's published by uh, a small Italian publishing house, the name of which in English would be Middle Earth, <laughs> like Tolkien, <laughs> Middle Earth. Uh, but they published a lot of guidebooks. Wonderful maps, very clear directions. In this particular trail, the Camino di San Benedetto, Simone wrote the guidebook for that, and it appears in both in Italian and German and English. So you can get whichever version you might want. Okay. And uh, it's just excellent. The trail itself is, is excellent. Um, the the uh, dem uh, demographics of the people who are on the trail might be a bit surprising because they're not so much young people. They tend to be middle-aged people. Uh, there are relatively few who are under 30. There are quite a few who are over 70. And uh, the, the, the biggest chunk are people in their 50s. And uh, the guidebook lays out 16 stages or daily walks along the trail, each about 20 kilometers long, so it's about 12 miles. And at the end of each one, we, you stop at a little town, and we'll talk about that after the break. All right. Very good. We're chatting with Carl Keating and his new number one new release, uh, Sun, Storm, and Solitude, discovering hidden in Italy. You know, we said Benedetto. More to come on the other side of the break. Listening at Sound Apologetic. Hi, this is Jesse Romero from the Terry and Jesse Show, also from Jesus 911. Let's face it, we all need to use the internet, but we need screen accountability. Why? Pornography is a huge problem, especially on the internet. And every time we tap into the internet, we get bombarded with images and temptations that degrade our humanity. So we need Covenant Eyes to block these pornographic sites and advertisements from infiltrating our lives. Covenant Eyes helps us take custody of our eyes and custody of our intellect. So I recommend you go to CovenantEyes.com and type in the promo code VMPR to support the network. Protect yourself and your family from the eminent threats on the internet. www.CovenantEyes.com Code VMPR Live Porn Free. Thank you for listening to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Thank you. God bless you. Keep the faith. Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. According to Pope St. John the Twenty-Third, it is not true that some human beings are by nature superior 
and others inferior. All human beings are equal in their natural dignity. May God help us to look upon everyone as a person created in His image and likeness and treat everyone the same without favoritism or prejudice. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And hey, welcome back, everybody. And we are talking about the brand new book, Sun, Storm, and Solitude, Discovering the Hidden Italy on the Camino di San Benedetto Trail with uh, the one and only Carl Keating, our guide for this hour. And, uh, Carl, right before the break, you were about to break down exactly what components uh, comprise this this pilgrimage. Right. As I said, the uh, guidebook uh, written by Simone Frignani, who's the man who laid out the trail about nine or ten years ago, uh, divides the route into 16 stages of about 12 miles apiece. And when Simone laid out the route, he not only wanted to, to have the route go through places known to have been places that St. Benedict himself visited or, or worked at, uh, but also to send the route through very interesting small towns, even let's call them villages or hamlets, they're so small, uh, up in the Apennine Mountains to the east of Rome. And uh, he succeeded in, in doing that. So so at the end of each daily stage, you come to what's normally a very small town, some of them with only a few hundred inhabitants. And they're very picturesque. Some of them go back to the Middle Ages, and you Simone arranged to have lodgings there. Some of the towns have hotels, others have B&Bs. Sometimes there are religious establishments. So on my hike, which I took last May, uh, I stayed in, in one town. I stayed at a convent. Several places I stayed at B&Bs, and others I stayed at small hotels. So uh, this is a kind of day hike route. You don't carry uh, a tent and sleeping bag and sleeping pad. You don't need those. Uh, you do carry everything else you need, and you walk the 12 or so miles each day, and then you lodge in one of these places. And I found it just wonderful. I met such interesting people, so kind, and they, some of them took me around and showed me local things, uh, whether famous monasteries or eateries or what have you. Mm-hmm. And uh, the towns I went through, many of them were just so amazing. I mean, I'd be tempted to to move there. And, you know, <laughs> if I could ever afford a second home overseas, I could imagine some of these places would be a great. Uh, a lot of the places that the trail goes through are largely depopulated. Mm. For example, one of my favorite towns is called Castel di Torre, and it sits above a giant lake on a hilltop. It's a medieval town, and it's got windy roads uh, and up at the top, there's a church and it's a small piazza. And I stayed at a at a little little establishment right there that had, a, I think, only about four rooms to rent. And so I rented one of the rooms there. Wonderful people, very very hospitable. But the whole area, the whole complex there, is medieval, and the town is is half empty because over the last few decades, young people have gone to Rome, which is about a two hour drive away, uh, for work and so on. So uh, one of the nice things about having this new route, it's beginning to bring people back to these small towns and making them known again and and giving some employment to local people and actually encouraging some folks, Italians and foreigners, to move into the area because with all these empty housing units, you know, you can get a, a wonderful deal. And uh, for a second home or a first home, whatever the case may be. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that's beautiful. So, uh, uh, so 
I, for me, I'm kind of shy. It would be a little intimidating to go to uh, like a small town like that, not knowing anybody. Uh, I, I guess if you go on this kind of pilgrimage, you have to be somewhat outgoing and <laughs> personable. No, no, you don't. You don't. You, you have to be reasonably personable if you're a grouch or something. Yeah, you know that that may precede you on the way. But if you're <laughs> any just a, a normal person, there's no problem because the people are so accommodating. Um, I, should, I should mention something else about the route. Let's, let's talk about how the route goes. You start in Norca, okay. which is in the region of Umbria. Umbria is probably most famous to Americans for Assisi, uh, St. Francis of Assisi. So that's not that long a drive away from Norcia. Hmm. And uh, you begin in Norcia. Unfortunately, in late 2016, Norcia suffered some tremendous earthquakes. And the basilica dedicated to... Uh, St. Benedict and his twin sister, St. Scholastica, the basilica that was built over the place that they were reputed to have been born, it collapsed entirely, except for the facade. And when I was back there in May, there had been no repairs effected. Uh, there's, there's no money. I mean, half the people in the downtown area lost their businesses because their buildings go back centuries and made of stone. Many of them became damaged and unsafe. And it, it may be decades before the Basilica, for example, could be reconstructed. Uh, but uh, you begin there, and there, were, there was a hotel right in the middle of town that had been earthquake-proof before the earthquakes. So it got through fine, and that's where I stayed. And you leave you leave the small town of Norcia, and immediately you get to the St. Scholastica Plain, which is a wide, broad area, uh, rounded mountains on either side. And you walk this route, and at first it's asphalt, a thin asphalt road, and uh, you end up going through lots of small towns along the way. And then there are also substantial lengths where you're just in countryside. The entire Camino, as I say, is, is almost 200 miles. It's about half a dirt trail and half asphalt paved road. And the roads are always ones that are very little trafficked. There were times when I had to walk on the roads because of inclement weather. And I would count how often a car would pass and sometimes it'd be 15 or 20 minutes. So oh, wow. you know, I had the road to myself often. Uh, wow. So you, 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 you go down there and, and uh, you know, I passed through uh, you know, many, many interesting places, many churches along the way. Uh, you know, unknown churches, but you go in there and they're just so beautiful and probably almost unknown to anybody but the locals. Uh, but they put to shame almost you know, any church you find in our country. And, uh, you know, it's a safe route. There are no wild animals except wild boar than a wild pig. I never saw one of those, although I think I heard one the very first day. I heard one in the bushes. But otherwise, there's no danger of any sort along the trail. It's very safe. Uh, a lot of single women, including older women, do the hike by themselves. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of couples. I didn't see a lot of people on this trail because I was sort of early in the season. I, I walked in May, and the, the high point is more like June or July. Although at that point, by July, it's getting pretty warm, even at that elevation. Uh, but I saw some people, most of the Pilgrims I met, I met at the lodgings in the evening. So, you know, we would be going at our own rates on the trail, and we'd end up running into one another in such places. Yeah, yeah, so that, yeah. That makes perfect sense. So you got to know actually some people along the trail. Uh, yes, I, I met a Scottish couple, for example. Uh, I had met a very interesting uh, Italian couple who were walking with their two little dogs. And that was <laughs> on that day. It was pouring. Cats and dogs, and, uh, <laughs> and, and when, there was one point we came to a waterfall that was actually going across the trail. Uh, there was so much rain coming down, and so what they had to do is pick up their dogs, like suitcases, and carry them across. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I met a good number of folks on the trail, uh, but most many days I saw nobody, except when I got to the lodgings in the evening, mm. and and that was sort of nice. Uh, I had a lot of solitude. There were places where you would, uh, you know, go up 
fairly steep hills and so on, and the views were expansive. Now, I had chosen to go in May because I figured May would be a good month. I don't like humidity, so I didn't want to go later in the summer. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I didn't want to go in winter either because I knew that in the winter, that area would actually have some snow. So I thought May would be ideal, but it turned out I went in in a May that was the coldest and wettest May in (laughs) decades. So often for me, uh, the trail was just a mass of running water or muck or mud, and it was slow going. But then other days, it'd be perfectly clear and I'd be making good time. I remember particularly the day I came across what's called the Trevi Arch. It's a a little arch of stone, uh, maybe 25 feet tall, a mountain path. Wise there was it a boundary between two regions? Nobody really knows, but it's it's an architectural yeah. waypoint and a piece of history that goes way back. There are a lot of those kinds of things to meet, and I mentioned all this in Sun, Star, and Solitude. You know, I uh, the book is just recently out, like last week, and it's available both in paperback and as a Kindle ebook at Amazon, and, and later on in, in a month or two, also as an audio book. Um, but my my goal here was to share my experience uh, and to appeal to a couple of different audiences, the audience that might listen to this program, I mean, you know, devout Catholics who are interested in the faith and, and want to know more. But as I said at the top of the, the show, most people who go on pilgrimage routes aren't really religious folks. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I wrote in a way to appeal to them, to get them to get something like this in or of a religious book that's usually too heavy for you know the spiritual but not religious books. But then again I also want to bring out as well so it's not just secular We're talking with Paul Keating about his book, Sun, Storm, and Solitude. Or to come on the other side of the book, you're listening to Hands On Apologetics. comes to my cubicle and he says to me, hey man, I've been listening to the Terry and Jesse show and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the mass in the morning. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he's an uh, on-fire Catholic and he promotes the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Daniel, what a testimony. And I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, Hands-On Apologetics, and we are chatting with Carl Keating about his brand new book, which is available on Amazon. It's called Sunstorm and Solitude, Discovering a Hidden Italy on the Camino di San Benedetto. And, uh, Carl, you know, I, I love this book. It, you write in such a snappy, engaging fashion that it really is a page-turner. And uh, now the ultimate end is uh, Monte de C- uh, Casino, right? That's right. Yeah, Monte Casino uh is probably best known to Americans for having been destroyed by Allied bombardment during World War right. II. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and, and then in the years after, it was built 
reconstructed exactly. Okay. So mm-hmm. Monte Cassino today, of course, is, is a gigantic complex. Uh, although it has very few monks in it, it once was the most populated Benedictine monastery in the world. Uh, and, of course, it looks nothing like what St. Benedict would have established in the early uh, 6th century. You know, he lived from 480 to 547. So, you know, no comparison there. But that is where he died and, uh, you know, where he's, he's buried. Uh, so that's the end point of the Camino di San Benedetto. Norcia, where he was born, was the beginning. And sort of at the middle is Subiaco, which I think might be the most interesting of all the places. Mm-hmm. This is where the young Benedict uh, went off to begin his religious career, shall we say. He spent three years living in a cave high on a cliffside in solitude. And then when his spiritual development was completed, he sort of came down from the mountain, so to, to speak, established monasteries, and developed what eventually became the Benedictine order. Uh, he wrote what's called a rule for it, for his monks. It's, which, it's not a very long book at all, uh, but it's been the most important uh, monastic writing of all time. Uh, Pope St. Gregory the Great, who was born about the same time that Benedict died, Uh, wrote a biography, which is the only real biography we have of the saint. And uh, it itself is a short book. Uh, As I mentioned in Sun, Storm, and Solitude, it's probable that although uh, the future pope could not have known uh, St. Benedict, he must have known any number of people who knew Benedict or people who had known people who knew Benedict. So we can have a, a certain confidence in Gregory's accounts of the miracles and so on that that St. Benedict performed. So Subiaco is sort of the key point. And nowadays, and really since the Middle Ages, it's been a wonderful place to visit because around this cave, sort of built up right on the side of the cliff, uh, are two or three levels of churches and oratories and other structures, even a monastery, uh, that now cover that original spot of St. Benedict. And one of the very very interesting things there is down below at the lower level, you can come across and see a fresco of St. Francis of Assisi painted, apparently, when Francis visited this site in about 1223. And the curious thing about this image of Francis is that uh, it was made about a year before he got the stigmata, because it doesn't show the stigmata. But he would have come there because his benefactor, uh, a future pope, was there to consecrate uh, the particular chapel where this fresco of St. Francis is. And so the pope's painted on one wall, and Francis has got actually a bigger image uh, on another wall. So Francis himself was a great devotee, shall we say, of Benedict, who, of course, you know, died so many centuries before. Uh, But we have what is probably the only from-life image of St. Francis. It's right there on the wall, and you can see it. Wow. Wow, that's neat. Now, are are these these structures, are they still being used, or, like, what condition are they in? Yes, they are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, They're in wonderful condition. Uh, And it's sort of a maze because, you, of course, you're building vertically on the side of a cliff. You're going up and down and in and out. So you've right. got a lot of different rooms, an, an upper church, a lower church, and then off-limits to tourists and pilgrims would be the monastery itself, which is at the further end. So Benedictine priests are still there. So I couldn't visit that, but I've been a, a couple of times now to uh, the main structures and churches at Subiaco. And it's it's a wonderful thing. It's one of those places that any Catholic visiting Italy ought to go anywhere, whether or not you walk the route. Right. Um, again, you know, I, I, I discuss in the book so many other places that have great historical significance. Um, they can all be driven to, if, if one so chooses, of course, whether it's Monte Cassino or Norcia or Subiaco or any of the small places in between. And uh, they all have, you know, a, I think a great delight for Catholics who are already knowledgeable about the faith, but they're also intriguing to folks who may not know much about 
Christian civilization or Catholic theology, and who may not themselves maybe be particularly religiously inclined. But as I say, I don't think you can walk this route or even visit portions of it by car without taking home a sense of what Chesterton called the Catholic thing, uh, you know, the sense that this is the origin of our civilization. And really, St. Benedict can be called the refounder of Western civilization after the collapse of Rome. Because Rome collapsed officially 476, just four years before Benedict was born. And Benedict laid the foundation for the civilization that's lasted to our own time. You know, in a certain way, he's the most important um, builder in Western civilization, certainly Western Christian civilization. So going along this route, I found it to be fascinating. I think people will like my account of it. You know, everything I say is true. I don't make up anything. There, there are high points and there are low points. There are dry points and there are wet points. Yeah. Uh, but it's all just as it happened. Yeah, it sounds like you actually go up some elevation, too, if it's uh, on a cliffside. Uh, you do. I mean, it's not a great, you, you know, there's not a, a daily walk. Uh, you don't gain more than uh, maybe 500 feet on average, you know, during the route. So there's some elevation gain, but people of all physical capacities just about are able to do the route. I mean, some people in their 80s have walked the route. Um yeah. But, uh, you know, there, it's in the hills. So, sure, there's going to be some up and down. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of forested area, a lot of great views, uh, lakes, uh, animals of all different sorts. I mean, I came across the trail. I didn't see a wild boar, but I saw, uh, you know, horses and chickens and cows and sheep and, you know, many domesticated animals. Uh, and, uh, I saw such a profusion of flowers, so many that I've never seen in America, that that was also amazing. So those who are, you know, horticulturally inclined also, I think, would, would very much enjoy the community sound that though. Yeah, yeah. It, are, were there, uh, like, specific shrines or anything uh, that along the way? That... Yeah. Yes, there were. So many yeah. sh little shrines I came to. There some, obviously not cared for for many years, the people who set them up having passed away, others with fresh flowers in them. Sometimes you come to what would have been an ancient, hmm, I mentioned the, the, the Arch of Trevi, but there are similar things you go through, and there are shrines within those that you can look into. I remember one not far from the Trisulti Monastery, there were a pair of roadside shrines, one on the left, one, one on the right of, of the paved road, and uh, they were well kept up. There was a, you know, a giant crucifix within one. And that was really the whole shrine was just built around the crucifix. But there were fresh flowers there. So, you know, people are keeping them up. Yeah. So there's still a devotion. You've got uh, a lot of Catholicism that's alive along this route. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it's not been secularized the way it's been in some of the bigger cities. You still have a lot of that social and religious sense it's, it's it's and it's wonderful and uh you know you, you you come across so many evidences of what had been in so many ways is a lively catholic faith yeah well i think th your book carl couldn't have been timed better with uh the covid crisis and you know travel restrictions and so on that I, I know many people probably listening would love to go on pilgrimage to that trail or other trails, and they can't. So they could do it vicariously through your book because uh, they it's could. a virtual they could. pilgrimage. Yeah, exactly. And, and actually, some of them will even think to be going here because this is a very doable pilgrimage. You don't have to do the whole thing. The guidebook, in fact, divides it into to thirds for those who have only a few days and want to go through certain segments. Uh, right. The whole thing takes about two weeks if you want to do it in one go. And that's not pushing it. That's leisurely where you've got, unless you've got really bad weather like the, the month that I was there. But if you go <laughs> in more friendly weather, um, you're going to have plenty of time in the afternoons to explore wherever you end up. Uh, so it's very doable for people who've never done this before. Most people who, whom I met along the way had never been on pilgrimage before. You know, there, there were uh, 
folks of all walks of life, of all, just about all physical shapes, sizes, and, and capacities. It's a very doable, but very lovely and very inspiring route to, to take. And, and my final chapter is called Gratitude, because I, I was so grateful that even though it didn't work out in all respects as I wished, because the weather, for example, was a problem, mm -hmm. uh, yet despite that, I had a wonderful time. I met wonderful people, and I think, you know, I got personally some good, re good uh, <laughs> mental and spiritual adjustments out of it. Let me put it that way. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think I think people will enjoy the book Sun, Storm, and Solitude, whether to take a pilgrimage at home by book or to get inspired someday to do it themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like I said, you are so such a gifted writer. Uh, you're so engaging. Uh, it's it's a snappy page turner, but it's also you feel like you're there. And uh, so, you know, thank you so much for writing this book, because like I said, you know, many of us are all you know claustrophobic being stuck in our houses. Now we can take a virtual trip through your book. Yeah, and, and uh, actually, I did time it for that. I, I was going to have the book out about a month earlier, but then realizing the situation, I thought, well, I want to have it where people are beginning to think about going outside again. So that uh, for those who might want to read the book as, as a potential inspiration to to go to Italy on their own, they have a chance to do so. Well, thank you so much, Carl. We appreciate it. Thanks, Derek. All right, Carl Keating, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, check out the book on Amazon. It's a great book to have, especially this time. Uh, Storm, uh, Sun, Storm, and Solitude, Discovering Hidden Italy, and Community San Benedetto. Uh, wow, the hour is flown, but never fear. The Terry and Jesse show will be here. And uh, I hope everybody has a great day. And God willing, we'll be back again tomorrow to do this thing we call Hands-On Apologetics. Bye-bye, everybody. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.